We, and, and then this guy calls up and he says, I believe George Bush is the Antichrist. And, and, and Savage asks him, he says, now, now what do you mean by the Antichrist? And the guy says, well, I'm a Christian, but I really don't know what that is. <laughs> Something about deceiving people, making it think it's one way when it's really another. And, and, but see, people use that, that Antichrist idea, the concept. Lo, here's Christ, there is Christ, they're not. The end's here. The end time. Earthquakes. You know, you know, last week I think I told you that they just had that about 8.0 earthquake in the Pacific out around the island of Fiji. And they were saying that there's going to be this big tsunami and didn't show up. You know, it didn't happen. But, you know, you, got, you ought to be prepared. And that kind of stuff. And I went, ooh, must be the end times, you know. The old wives tale about, uh, when, you know, in the last days you won't be able to tell the weather. Can't tell the weather. Can't tell the seasons. You never heard that one? You know, you, you, you've been living in, you've been an urban dweller too much. But uh, the, the, the uh, you can't tell the differences in the seasons and so forth. And that's, that, that's not the Bible. That's just, a, you know, a little wives' tale that gets passed around. And Christ says, those things aren't the signs. And then he tells them in verse 12 to verse 17, you guys are going to have some tough times. But don't worry about it. I've already instructed you. I've already given you instruction. I'm going to give you equipping to get through all of that. Verse 19 is the summary of what he says. In your patience, possess ye your soul. And that's the key piece of advice for the tribulation saint. It's good advice for you and me too, frankly, based on Romans 8, verse 25. But for these people, in your patience, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Okay? In your patience, staying with the word, not letting the circumstances, the tough times, carry them away. Come back with me to Isaiah 28. This is a quote or a, or a reference back to Isaiah chapter 28 in, a, in a, a very important passage about the tribulation. The preachers would say this passage is pregnant with meaning. In Isaiah 28, beginning at verse 14 to the end of the chapter, there's a passage about the tribulation and about the second advent of Christ that is, is one of the key passages that's generally overlooked about this time. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, verse 14, ye scoffful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we in agreement. Now, when you read about a covenant with death and with hell, we're in agreement. Your mind immediately, I know, went, went to where? Revelation chapter 6. That's right. So everybody speaks at once. Where the, that fourth horse, horseman, you remember, death and hell followed him. Part of the, the career of the Antichrist is being described there. And what these people, these people are saying in Jerusalem we're going to be okay because we've made a covenant with death and with hell we've got an agreement. And by that verse you can write down Daniel 9 verse 27 because they're going to make a covenant with that man, that Antichrist, for one week. There's the covenant. Here the people have already made the covenant. You're already in the 70th week here. Now what he's going to tell them is, is how good that covenant is. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come upon us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Now that's not what they're saying. That's what the Lord's telling them they've done. So that's, this is the Lord's description about what they've done. They don't say we made an agreement with death and with hell and we a covenant with death. They say we've got a covenant with this guy over here. He's going to be our Savior. And God says, no, you made, a, you made a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. You made a covenant with the satanic policy of evil personified in this man of sin. You bought into the lie program. Now, I just quoted 1 Thessalonians 2, the man of sin. And in 2 Thessalonians 2, he talks about God going to send them strong delusion that they might believe a what? A lie. 
There's the lie. They made lies their refuge. Verse number 17. Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies. And the waters shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled. And your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then you shall be trodden down of it. In other words, it, their, their, their agreement isn't going to do them any good at all. For the time that is go, it, it, from the time that it goeth forth, it shall take you. From morning by morning shall it pass over, by day and by night, and it shall be a vexation only to understand the report. For the bed is shorter than that a man can stretch himself on, on it, and the covering narrower than he can wrap himself in it. You ever tried to sleep on a bed that you were too big for? And you couldn't get, your cover was too narrow to cover you up? That's kind of a miserable existence, you know. I was at the hospital the other day when Brother George Reimer went to went into the surgery, and they came in and got him, and they were they were bandaging a, a wound on his foot. And when he got through, he um, George is a. He, he, I told somebody he, tonight if you if you took the word gentleman in the dictionary and you put his picture by it, you'd have a map, a map definition. And here he is going to surgery, and you, they've got you all prepared and all. And he says, "Could I have a sock?" He said, I don't feel properly dressed without socks on. <laughs> well, George, we're not going to a dance, and we're not going to church. <laughs> You're going to surgery. And so, so they, they got him a sock, put socks on him. And then they're pushing him down the hall, going, going to the elevator. We walk, he and Isabel and I walked down there with him. And I said, wait, wait just a minute. I said, it makes me uncomfortable to see he's got one foot that's not covered up. You know, he's got one foot sticking out. So I went down and covered his foot up. You know, they're, they're, you just, it, you're a little more comfortable that way. You're, you, got, you guys got these ideas that are going to fail you, and you're going to have a miserable result from it. Now, he goes on to describe, verse 21, for the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perazim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. And he goes on down to describe how he's going to destroy the satanic policy of evil and those in Israel who are part of it. You notice the description in verse 21. And this, this is a key to Bible study, especially in prophecy. The Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perazim. Now, if you don't know anything about the book of, of Samuel, 1st and 2nd Samuel, you won't know what that is. And if you ever just studied 1st and 2nd Samuel and thought, well, what am I reading all this stuff for? Well, one good reason to study it is when you got over to Isaiah, it said that stuff back in 2 Samuel chapter 5, with the going of the tops of the mulberry trees and all that stuff with David winning that battle over there and how, how, he, how he had some supernatural forces going out and fighting for him. This passage is saying that when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back in his second advent, it's going to, that passage back in 2 Samuel 5 is going to describe some of the events for you. In other words... When the Bible wants to tell you what the second coming of Christ is going to be like, what times in the tribulation are going to be like, it'll go back into the history of the Old Testament, and it'll say, you see that over there? That was a dress rehearsal for this. When he says, he shall be wroth, wrathful, full of wrath and anger, as in the valley of Gibeon, well, that's in Joshua chapter number 10. That's why over there in Zechariah 14, we'll get to that passage in a few minutes, he says that he's going to go forth and fight as in the days of old. The books of Exodus, Numbers, Joshua, 1st, 2nd Samuel, those wars back there. Those wars are in large part and in, 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 in large measure pictures of events that will take place in the future at the second coming during the tribulation. That's why they call the books of the wars of the Lord. And it's like little dress rehearsals. And what Israel will do is they'll take a passage like that, and they'll be able to go back there, and when that time period comes for that to happen, they'll have...